So yes, I am an airship aficionado. <laughs> ships, all right. So if you're gonna drink every time I say ships, you're gonna be drunk by the end of my talk. All right, I, I actually brought paper notes. Just to add, add a little bit to the, uh, to the talk here. All right, so let's talk about blimps. But why do you need blimps? <laughs> well, here is something we're all familiar with, Carl, Carl the Fog. Now, I want you to imagine it's 1942. You're here in California, here in San Francisco. Just that previous December, the Japanese launched the horrible attack on Pearl Harbor, catching us completely unaware. And it's not been so good in the few months since. The US was so desperate to counter the attack by air in Pearl Harbor, they launched the Doolittle Raid, which was effectively a one-way ticket for folks on B-25 bombers off of carriers flying west to Japan. And basically they said, hey, if you manage to bomb Japan, great. After that, you're on your own. own. Somehow you're gonna magically get to China and you'll be rescued. We don't know what's gonna happen, but Godspeed. But the thing about this is, is that at this time, fog represents a huge mystery because we don't have radar. Is there a Japanese carrier group lurking just 10 miles offshore? We don't know. At this point in time, in 1942, six merchant ships have been sunk off the western coast of the United States by Japanese subs. We can't tell if they're there or not. So, blimps, because blimps can hover over the sea for a long period of time while also radioing back visual reports. And so the United States quickly basically purchased the Goodyear blimps entire arsenal of airships. There was a whole series of, yes, there you go, okay. And so there's a whole series of K-class blimps, which were fitted out with four different uh, depth charges as well, 50 caliber machine guns and 30 caliber machine guns. But the problem with blimps and airships, as is evidenced by the Macon disaster in, in 34, is that they're kind of fragile. <laughs> so if you think about operating in fog, it's not a good combination. So. Unfortunately, this tale, spoiler alert, involves the L-8, which was the si subsequent class to the K-series, crashing in San Francisco. Now, there are some amazing accounts of the people watching this blimp crash. And part of it was due to the fact that they referred to as looky-loos, which I think is a fantastic turn of phrase. Uh, but one of the questions is, why did this crash? Well, I want you to start thinking about why and we'll come back to that. So first we have to start with these two guys. Uh, on the left is Ernest Cody, who's 27, un sporting an unfortunate facial hairstyle. <laughs> um, yeah, that's true. Uh, so the interesting thing about Cody is uh, he only had about 700 hours in airships, uh, which is not that much time for, air for flight time, but he had one key element in his resume which is that he piloted the L-8 to deliver 300 pounds of late supplies that arrived in San Francisco out to the carrier that was going to deliver the Doolittle raid. He dropped off 300 pounds of supplies onto a carrier deck that was bobbing and swaying in the middle of the Pacific. And so the US Navy, when they needed a new airship pilot, said, you're it. Now the interesting thing is he's 27. However, his other, this other fellow here, is, I, I, love, I love this guy, Adams. Charles Adams, he's 38. He had 220 hundred hours in airships, including service on the ZR-3, otherwise known as the USS Los Angeles, the ZRS-4, the USS Akron, the ZRS-5, the USS Macon, all of which were heavier than air airships. And it, even better than that, he was awarded a distinguished cross from the German government for pulling people out of the burning wreckage of the Hindenburg disaster. I kind of want to be this guy in a, in a past life. <laughs> All right, so, so they're both proven pilots. They both had plenty of time on airships, and they're also upstanding citizens with wives and children. So start to narrow down those theories on why they disappeared. And so 
the, the, the USS Navy L-8, otherwise known as Love-8, was a 150-foot blimp uh, held aloft by 123,000 cubic feet of helium with a cruising speed of about 43 knots. And it held, most importantly of its arsenal, were two 325-pound Mark 17 depth charges, as well as a 30 caliber machine gun, as well as a number of signal flares to designate the location of submarines. All right, so on August 16, 1942, the L-8 Flight 101 was scheduled to take off from Treasure Island at 6 a.m., go out to the Farallon Islands, then go to Port Reyes, down to Montana Beach, and final back to Treasure Island. So a big figure eight. And it was uh, scheduled to be about a four-hour flight. Not a three-hour cruise, a four-hour <laughs> flight. And get them home at a leisurely 10 or 10.30, just in time for lunch. So they take off from Treasure Island, light wind, good, good visibility. They could see the tours happening on the Golden Gate Bridge. And they headed for the Farallon Islands. And at 7.30, they radio their four miles east of the Farallons, great white shark-infested waters, and interestingly, perhaps Japanese submarine-infested waters. Because at 7.42, Cody radios in, am investig investigating suspicious oil slick, stand by. They do drop two Mark IV float lights, I love these names on these things, um, to mark the spot, then begin descending closer and investigating. Now at this time, Japanese submarines are a huge threat. Now, the San Francisco actually had a submarine net set up in order to prevent s US foreign submarines from entering the Golden Gate and getting into the East Bay. Because if you remember, and if you've been up to Richmond and you've seen the, all of the manufacturing facilities, the Bay Area was just pumping out munitions at this point. Uh, the US was in full war industrial footing. All it would take would be a few torpedoes or a few shells from a deck gun to set alight millions of dollars of equipment and it would severely hamper the war effort in the Pacific. So Love 8 radios investigating when they go silent. So this isn't that unusual. I mean, there are only two people on this blimp. And home base radios in asking for reports. No response. And this is also nothing unusual. It wasn't until 8.20 that Patrol HQ had been notified that the blimp had been silent for 35 minutes. By 8.50, two Voight uh, OS2U Kingfisher float planes were sent to go locate the blimp, and local aircrafts were, were asked to be on the alert. So we're starting to scramble folks here, because think about it, that like, what if there is a submarine? What if the submarine is the beginning of an invasion force? You may have seen the gun emplacements in Marin. Like, the Bay Area was prepared. We thought this would be a target. And that while the Navy was becoming more and more worried, uh, two, two, two fishing vessels, own, otherwise known as ships, <laughs> there we go, all right, the, <laughs> the, the Daisy Gray and the Galatian, uh, they were watching, uh, watching the Love 8, and she circled for nearly an hour, two to 300 feet, then dropped to 30 feet above the ocean, and then finally around 9 a.m., she dropped ballast, rose, and appeared to be heading back to San Francisco, which, Interestingly enough, the flight plan had her flying to Point Reyes next. Back at HQ, still radio silence. At 10.49, a Pan American Clipper, such a good logo, uh, reported seeing the blimp over the Golden Gate Bridge. Ooh. Enhance. <laughs> All right. So at, at one of the Kingfishers reported seeing the L-8 three miles west of Salina Beach, rising through the overcast at 2,000 feet, which is still within its height range. Then a few minutes later, the blimp began to descend, disappearing in the clouds. The blimp still appeared to be under control. At 11.15, a member of the Olympic Golf Club saw an explosion as the blimp briefly touched down on Ocean Beach and discharged one of its depth charges. <laughs> yeah, if you were on the beach that day, you were having a bad day. All right, one club member reported to have seen a parachute descending from the L-8 while the blimp was still offshore, and he wasn't the only one to see something of the crew. Um, and it became an interesting thing, like the, the blimp was not under control at this point, and the crowd had began to, uh, began to watch. 
and the blimp headed directly for Daly City where it drifts low enough to hit power lines and send people running from its gondola. Thank goodness it wasn't filled with hydrogen because the United States controls the U.S. Helium's reserve, but that's a whole to other topic. <laughs> All right, um, so at, at 11.38, the L8 comes to rest in the middle of the 400 block of Bellevue Avenue. So it's bouncing all around here. Boom. All right, William Morris, a volunteer firefighter, and the first person on the scene, his car hood was actually dented by the L8. Um, he rushes to the crew's rescue and finds nothing. The door was unlatched and no one was inside. The blimp's envelope was then slashed to see if the crew was inside and nothing was found. The crew was gone, but nothing was out of pace, place. The radio was still working, the engines were fine, all the parachutes were still there, and the briefcase with all of the secure Navy radio co codes was still in the blimp. <laughs> Nothing but two flotation jackets were missing, except for the crew. They were missing. The search party went out. Nothing. 35 eyewitnesses questioned nothing. Nothing, nothing, nothing. And then men were declared dead. Full investigation was launched, no fire, no submersion, no misconduct, no missiles struck the LA. Missiles, who's fucking missiles? Uh, <laughs> and their conclusion was that abandonment was involuntary. <laughs> Captured by the Axis, spies for the Axis, experimentation with radar gone wrong. There was a theory at this point that maybe they had an experimental radar unit on board, but it was a microwave, and then when they turned it on, it basically fried their brains and they fell out. And nearly 80 years later, the disappearance, disappearance has still not been solved. You know, was it mermaids? Definitely, Definitely mermaids. Yeah, okay, well, I think we're all, we're all, we're all gonna agree it's mermaids here. Um, yeah, it's definitely mermaids. But I think a key, a key point here is that the third character on the story is actually still here with us. The L8 was actually put back to work. And when World War II ended, she became a Goodyear blimp, finally retiring in 1980, to, and now lives in the National Aviation Mu Museum in Pensacola, Florida. So I'd like you all to raise a glass to mysteries and think about what are the mysteries that Carl the Fog has seen and is yet to see. <laughs> Cheers. Please give it up for him. He did that with two hours notice. That was, wow. And, and we were talking, some of us fellows were talking before, that is the new official Odd Salon record for not enough notice to do a talk. So thank you so much. Uh